In the previous lecture, we talked about functions and updaters. And functions and updaters are, in a very strong sense, uh, instruments that only deal with how the state of our application changes. And obviously they are very powerful, we can nest horizontally, we can nest vertically, but how do we define the state and how do we define structures or in our application? That is what we're going to tackle today. So structures or data structures if you want are a fundamental pillar of modern computing because thanks to structures we can think in terms of what exists in our program at any given time. time. And because we use statically typed programming languages, which is really our focus, um, thanks to strict and expressive type definitions, by defining structures we don't only say what information do we track about the domain we're modeling, but also which information do we not allow to be tracked. Because a type not only defines what you do store, but also what you don't. For example, if you look at this type of person, it says that you do store ID, full name and age, but it's also strictly stating you do not have an address in person. And there are a lot more things you do not have than things you do have when modeling data types, etc. So this is very interesting because it uh, very cleanly and narrowly restricts the focus of our application to a lot less than all possibilities. Um, and containers can be actually very simple. I'm going to, yeah, everything is source controlled, so I'm going to re remove this. Uh, for example, we could have a container such as uh, a point, which has uh, two numbers, x and y. Uh, and as such a container is simple because, of course, it performs a very useful function, but it offers nothing besides its extremely strictly defined predetermined structure. It cannot be adapted. It cannot be changed to support uh, uh, different things. Like if we say, okay, this shape looks good, but what if I want to have two strings or two dates or two arrays of strings or whatever? This thing is completely sealed. It cannot be um, modified in any way and there is no composition. So what we want to do now is we want to take a step back and start using types in order to build flexible and composable building blocks which are defined and debugged only once and then used in many different contexts without having to reinvent a slightly similar wheel for every new context that appears in front of our nodes. Enter generic data structures. Data structures are called generic when they can change the way they behave so the data they contain or the process they model, because data types are not just telling us how to contain data in memory. A data structure such as a promise, a thread or a process can represent a computational path that will yield data at some point and not necessarily giving us the data, but just giving us the recipe that can fetch, find, or compute the data for us. And that's why we can say that, in general, these generic data structures model behavior rather than containment, and containment is a form of behavior. And we can change this behavior, the shape of the behavior, depending on some parameters. And this is called the generic programming, or parametric polymorphism. For example, let's say that we want to define a container which might store data of any type, together with a counter of sorts. Uh, so because we want to store any sort of data, then we need a generic parameter. The type will be a counting container or a container. And the content, let's call it just content, uh, will be of any type we want. And we can say, okay, there's content of type content, but there's a counter, and the counter is a number. And you can see here, well, the content of the box 
is well known. It's, sorry, <laughs> is well known, of course, but it will change from container to container. The counter, on the other hand, cannot change. It's always a number. I mean, the value can change, but the structure, the type, cannot. The funny thing is that line 26 doesn't model one type, but rather it models infinitely many types. Which ones? Well, we could say that it models the number container, which is a container of a number. Or we could have the, uh, the string container, which is a container of you imagine right string but also we could have uh, a strings container which is a container of array of string and so on notice that i'm mentioning whenever i i read this i say container of string so i'm treating these two signs smaller than and greater than uh, as brackets so it's not container smaller than string or string greater than god knows what this is Container of string because the container in a very vivid sense is also a function that takes as input a type Which in the parametric definition is called the content. That's the name of this type argument and Returns us the type where the argument the type parameter has been replaced with whatever argument was passed So basically container of number is kind of like saying okay take this type and replace with content, which doesn't exist, of course, uh, put a number. And in the case of a string container, then we take the definition of the type and we put string instead of content, and so on. And what I'm doing here is called, uh, well, substitution, which is quite an intuitive uh, idea. But we don't want to rewrite the same type. In this case, we only have content and counter. Imagine if we had 50 fields. And also, if I want to modify the definition of container, like uh, uh, Okay, we have premium containers. I don't know what this might mean, but bear with me. By adding yet another field to the container, then this field is now available in the number container, string container, and strings container in one go. Because obviously being able to give a name to something and refer referencing that name makes it possible to change the named thing uh, and automatically, therefore, also changing all the connected instances. All right. Now, um, well, of course, the fundamental question that we'll ask is uh, how do things compose? And also, how does this new concept that we have now, like this uh, idea of a generic container, how does this compose with what we have already? And what do we have already? Oh, we have functions. Hmm, okay. So, uh, let me actually undo everything because I do want to go back to our uh, inker, decker, etc. functions. Okay. So, I have, you know, increment, decrement, double, doctorify, and all these things. So, suppose now, let's focus on inker, okay? So I have this uh, inker function here, which is a function from number to number. And suppose I have a container of number. So I have a, a container of number. And well, let's actually state that this is a container of number. And then, uh, well, okay, the content will be, well, we know already the content is a number. And the counter is a number. Both start at zero. Okay, great. Now, I have a container of number, and I have a function like inkra. How can I combine these things? Because uh, now inkra works from number to number. But in a sense, container of number is not very different from just a number, because it also carries the counter, but yeah, that's we can ignore the counter. Like the content of the container is a number now. So it kind of makes sense that I should be able to just modify the, the content. Also, let's take a look at 
container of string. And of course, we get a compiler error. Let's say that this is uh, the content. Okay, so now I have a container of string. A container of string is also not very different from a string because that is the content plus some extra bit of information, which we obviously want to just carry along as it is. But I have a function like doctorify, which goes from string to string. And maybe I want to apply this function to the content of the container. Also, uh, let's see, is uh, string empty? Yes, so let's, add, uh, let's add yet another method. Uh, can you say is empty? No, but I can say that the length is zero. And now is, uh, is string empty is a function from string to boolean. And I could also say, okay, but I have a container of string. I want to apply maybe is string empty to the string contained in the container. So this whole thing suggests that we might want to be able to perform a transformation on the content of the container, but the con this transformation, in order to be well behaved, well, it should take as input the whole container, transform the content into whatever we want, and then repackage the whole thing into a new container where the content has been transformed as we want, but the extra information this is what we call the structure, the surrounding structure, which is the shape and the remaining fields, has not changed at all. Now, let's take a look at this. Uh, let's define transform container as, well, uh, we said this can be applied to the container of number, to the container of string, and we can go from container of number to container of number, from container of string to container of string. But if we add some, apply something like a string empty, we can also go from a container of string to a container of boolean. And also if we apply greater than zero, we can go from a container of number to a container of boolean. This means that we have an input and an output. And we start from the input container which is a container of input, a function f from input to output, and the result will be a container of output. All right. Now, how do we do this? Well, we have the input the output and these need to be containers and you know what I'm going to do I'm very simply going to state that I make a copy of the whole input data structure but the content oh the content well I want to produce an output all I have is the input container which also has a content, but this content has the wrong type. And now, okay, so look, this thing is smart enough actually to know that well, the content of what we return should be output, but we're trying to pass input, and these two types are not related. Ah, if only we had a way to convert an input into an output, and lo and behold, we do. We do. It's F. Oh, look here. Well, the whole thing is happy now, and uh, well, let's try it. So, console.log, let's transform container cn with function inc. Let's run this. Uh, Let's first uh, enter the right folder. TSC uh, minus watch and node out slash index.js. Oh, look, the content has been incremented. Okay, let me see. Let, let me see what happens if I now say um, that I actually want to apply then to. Uh, to, to the inked function and say, I want to increment twice, why not? Okay, now this is a function from uh, number to number again. Let's run this again. Ooh, the content is true now. Okay, okay, looks reasonable. What if I want to say no, first increment, then double, and of course, oh yeah, okay, and then double again. Okay, now the, now the value is four because it was zero, plus one, one, times two, two, times two, four. 
Uh, what if we want to check that the result of this is greater than zero? Well, we know that this is going to be true, and now the type of the counter has changed. And in case you're wondering, uh, let's say constant temp, uh, uh, this is the result of transform container. What is the type of temp? Of course, it's container of boolean. Now let's apply the transformation to the to the container of string. So let's pass here CS and we get immediately a complaint. Why? Because uh, this transformation here uh, is is not really allowed because it's a transformation from number to to boolean. And now we need a, a, to pass a transformation from string to whatever. So let's say doctorify, the content was content. And now we get doctor content. It does make a lot of sense, but still. And is this empty? Well, let's check. So uh, we have a string, we add doctor, then we check if the string is empty. And the string is not empty because doctor content is not an empty string. Transform container is a mapping function. And the next thing we're now going to do is we're now going to add the mapping function to the container so that we can call container.map. Uh, but I'm going I'm actually going to do two things. First, I'm going to change the name of this because this truly is a, map, a mapping function, and I find it actually handy to have a uh, uh, map container, of course. Uh, uh, I find it actually very handy to have the function separately from the rest because then I can call it in another context. And also, I'm going to play around with the... I'm, I'm going to clean up the type first. Why? Because if I take the parameters in a slightly different order, like this one, The function is exactly the same, because it is exactly the same. Map container takes as input, okay, a function from input to output, then returns a function from container of input to container of output. And, well, what does this function do? It takes the container of input as parameter. This is called carrying, and it means that we take the parameters in order. And if we play around with the order in a smart way like we just did, we can actually create some elegant symmetries, because in this case, well, of course, now we have to pass these parameters in a different order. So first, you could say I create the pipeline, and in this case, I, I call map container. I say what do I want to do with the with the content, and haven't passed a container yet. So this is a function from container of string of container of boolean, and then the next parameter I can pass is the actual container of string, which can be CS. So basically, instead of a comma, there's two brackets, but what I gained is that now I am transforming functions into functions. Just like then is something that combines two functions, so it operates at a higher order of uh, abstraction in a sense. What we achieved here is also that map container takes as input a function from input to output which knows nothing about um, Containers, like this function knows nothing whatsoever about containers. Works on numbers, strings, arrays, but yeah, works on anything, but it's not bound to containers. And what we do is we translate this function into a function that is basically the same as f, but with a wrapper around it, so that we teach f how to operate on containers. And I'm going to try to put these two definitions under each other and you can see that what map container really does is it puts container around the type arguments because we give it a function from input to output and it gives us back a function from container of input to container of output and this function that we get the result we get it's really f with some padding around it but it's still f because the thing that really knows what we're doing is f and that is why f is embedded inside this bigger function. I, I, I actually really like this idea of, of embedding operations from a more narrow, a narrower domain into a bigger domain which has more structure because here we have the same structure that we had in input and output but we also have the extra structure provided by the 
container itself. But now, it's also very nice. So, well, actually, there are, there are two things that are quite nice. One is that I could say, okay, map container doctorify, and because this is now a function, I can say, okay, then, and then here I can pass another function, but this one has to operate on the resulting container of string. So here I could say map container of, uh, uh, and now from string to whatever, so let's say is string empty, and this is essentially the same thing we had before. So you can see that now because map container gives us a function back, a fun back, then we can apply then either here or inside the call to map container. So at the top level or at uh, so at a sibling level or at a higher level. Or yes. And well, obviously the container also has other stuff like increment. And we have the counter. So maybe sometimes we just, just want to take a container and increment its counter. So here I can simply say, okay, this is, uh, so what is increment? Uh, increment is, is generic. It takes as input uh, just the content. Then it takes as input um, the input, which is a container of content, and returns a container of content, because the content doesn't change if we only increment uh, the counter. So I make a copy of uh, the input, and then I can say that the counter is the same as input.counter plus one. And now I could say, and this is also a better example, okay, doctorify, then is string empty. This is what I want to do when mapping. There is no reason to create two intermediate containers, but after this I increment. And, oh, I need to wrap it in a fun, yes. I cannot uh, turn increment into a function because it's generic in the input. And this is a minor limitation of a... Uh... Now, um, what we are going to do is we are indeed going to, um, going to add this little touch of elegance, uh, or at least, I don't know if it's particularly elegant to be honest, but uh, uh, at least we harmonize the interface of the container to what we are a bit more used to, which is the map function. Uh, so that we also have a map, map function in the container, which is going to be exactly the same as map container, but still. Uh, now, what is map? Map is a generic function in the output. Why only the output? Well, because the input is, is the content of the current container we're calling map on. We take as input f, which is a function from content to uh, output and we return a container of output. Is this thing happy? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, now, okay, so map container now is uh, mildly unhappy. Um, oh, because the, <laughs> because the map function is not correct. Yes, of course. So map will be, so every, every time we initialize a container, we are supposed, but we're going to clean this up as well, to put the value of the map function. I'm going to do it once and then I'll generalize it. Okay, so this is a function and we go here to a new output. So let's call this output true, because this is after we transform into output, well, what we get is, a, a, is, is something else. And this is a function from output, that is the current value, the current content, into output two, and then we're supposed to return a container of output two. Uh, of course, oh, I missed a bracket. Of course, the, this is a container of output because this is the result of this specific transformation. And well, I do need to go to a new line. Uh, and what do we return? I will just return map container of this and f. No. Uh, let's take a look. Hmm, why would it be unhappy? Oh, apparently I'm a bit more tired than, uh, than I thought I was. Yes, map container takes the arguments in order. <laughs> Okay, and, and this is actually good. This actually makes sense. We'll, we'll see 
uh, we'll, we'll see why later. Now, the definitions of CN and CS are, the, are a bit screwed up, so you know what, let's clean this up. So now I will uh, split the definition of container in container data versus uh, the full container. So that I can actually say that this here is the container data, and then I will define a sort of constructor of the container, very much like we defined a constructor for the fun. For fun. So here we take the data, which will be container data of content. And what we are going to return is going to be, okay, well, the data, of course. Now let's specify that this returns a container of content. So this basically takes the data and adds the map function to it. And what will the map function look like? Well, let's be partially lazy. This is from content into output. We take as input the container of content as this. We go from content to output. We return a container of output and this definition is happy. So here I can get rid of this very ugly map function. This here is a content and I can just wrap it into a container and everything is happy. And now I can also add this container wrapper hoop and hoop and very good. All right, I always like how with functional programming it is possible to emulate object orientation. Uh, and this kind of suggests how powerful the framework of functional programming is, how, how exceptionally powerful it is. Okay, now what we can do is we can still call map container, like I have this uh, map container which goes from container string into container of boolean, and I can just apply it and say, okay, here's the container of string, and it just does what it's supposed to do and produces false. And you can see now there's also the map function which we're carrying around with us. Very good. Or um, I could also say um, that I start from CS and then I map, and here I pass a function from string to unknown. And what is this going to be? Well, I'm going to doctorify and then apply is string empty, not entirely done yet. Uh, because now the content is false, by, but the counter is one, and then, uh, yeah, then I, then, then I have to apply increment, and in this case I would say, okay, take increment and apply it, and yeah, okay, sure, there you go, now it's, it's applied. Honestly, I do like this syntax a little bit more, because it focuses first on performing um, on performing, um, on creating and defining the transformation, and it doesn't focus on values. Like you can define this pipeline here, and this is just part of the definition of the business logic of your program. So here we now have this block here, which I'm going to say the um, foundational framework of your application. Like you have containers. Having containers is kind of a, a universal thing. Then you have specific containers and operations of them. So these are the operations on containers. Well, right now we only have this temp operation, but perhaps we want to have on, on specific containers, sorry. And this is a specific operation on containers of string into containers of boolean. This doesn't need to make a lot of sense as a real application. And then we have the values of actual containers in memory. And and their processing. And I do really like it when we split things neatly because this makes it easier to think about stuff in isolation. Like first you build the foundational framework. Okay? And, and we have these ape-like brains that were really engineered to do, well engineered, bio-engineered you could say, in order to do something that is very different from how we are using our brain when we become programmers. Like our brains were really meant to distinguish is that like a very small lion or a big lion that's far away or at the same time is this just a huge lion that's still very far or is it a normal sized lion that is this close to my face and is about to eat me, you know? This is very important stuff to, to be able to quickly 
understand, you know. That's what our brain was made for. So our brain wasn't really made to think about code, you know, in any evolutionary sense. So it's good if we try to make the problem as small as possible. And here we have the foundational framework and that's it. Easy to think about, clean to think about, etc. Then we move into thinking about what happens to these containers and the domains and then later we think about okay how do values actually end up populating the containers and what am I supposed to do uh, with these values. And every one of these logical bits can even be done by different people. Like you could imagine this is kind of the work for an architect slash senior developers, this is senior meteor, this is definitely junior and this is again uh, yeah this is again a bit senior when you when you bring all these things together or medium. So it's good because different team members with different skill sets can actually operate on the same code base in a very clear definition of roles. All right, now, uh, so let's generalize this because this construct actually can be generalized. We started with container, which is a generic type. So I'm going to write down what we had. A generic type with a or a type with a generic parameter. Well, if it has a generic parameter, then it's a generic type. That's why I removed the generic from type with a generic parameter uh, content. Um, then we have a generic function which lifts an existing simpler function f into the domain of our container. So let's say that container now, not container, uh, or of our generic type, better than, than container. Yes, container is very misleading, potentially very misleading. Um, uh, of our generic type uh, tra by transforming the content and preserving the rest of the structure. Yes, once again this word structure. Okay, but this same process of defining such a transformation can then be applied to more than just our container. So we could say, imagine this, we have f of content or even f of a. I hope you're okay if I call this f of a. It looks really hardcore. Uh, f of a, and this is something that contains values of type a. So I'm going to put the, the three dots here, just mean we, we don't know what's in there, it's just a value. Is it an array, a map, a set, a container? We don't know, we, it doesn't matter. And we don't really care about the content or the shape. But then we can define the transformation, map f. And this is generic in the input content and the output content, which I would call A and B. And in this case, I'm calling them A and B as a very clear statement of I don't care what they are. Like A and B, it's the laziest we can possibly be. And this laziness actually carries some meaning. And then I take a function from the input content and the output content, and I return a function from f of a, so the input content, but neatly wrapped inside f, whatever that shape f may have, whatever structure f may, may have. And then I return f of b, which is, well, the content of a, was it zero values, one value, 50 values, we don't know. They are all turned into b's. But whatever is around them, the surrounding structure, in the case of the container, of course, the counter, that has remained exactly the same. It is a little bit unfortunate that in TypeScript it's a bit difficult to define uh, generic functors. We will, uh, we will make a valiant attempt, but unfortunately this kind of definition stating a functor must have the type, which must be containing the value a, so it must be covariant. Uh, so it's a return type of methods inside f, or it's actually contained as a value of f, and it's not an input of a method of f, because in that case it's contravariant. And then we want the map function and it needs to have this signature. It's a bit difficult to actually encode this in TypeScript. We can do it, but it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit meh. Uh, so we have to keep the definition of such a, a structure preserving 
transformation or well the type itself is the structure so a structure with a structure preserving transformation so the structure is the type and the structure preserving transformation is the map function uh, over that type uh, and okay we keep the definition here in a comment like we know it in our heads and I will give you a few extra examples of such structures and we start with the identity, which is kind of pointless in a sense, but we could say that, well, okay, the identity type is just, a, well, nothing. So, so identity of number is just number, identity of string is string. So it's a type which with no structure whatsoever. And then we can define a map identity as, okay, let, let's take, you know, Let's take this definition. I will copy and paste it. The fact that I can copy and paste the definition is actually a very big deal. Uh, now I only change the instances, the occurrences of, of f. Okay, now I create the function. I take the actual value, which is identity of a, which TypeScript has, is already telling me it's kind of like an a. Yes, it is. Uh, value. Um, and I just apply f to the value. And actually, this is very, very similar. One could say identical to just saying, well, this is f. So take us input the value, give it to f, and give the result back. Well, that's kind of f. So funnily enough, you could even say that <laughs> this is also just the identity function, because it takes us input f and returns f. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of, kind of funny. So this is the identity, and this actually happens to be the identity function. I'm going to leave this definition because it's because uh, it's easier to copy. Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to also define another type, which is the option. Option option has a little bit more structure. Option defines something that is either uh, full or empty. I can say that option is empty, or option is full, and it has some content of type A. Content or value? Let's call it content. It doesn't really matter that much. Now we'll define map option. And the signature, f is the same because f is um, independent of the structure, of course. It's the thing that we want to embed. So f knows nothing about the structure. But what we do return does know about the structure. So this takes as an option of a and turns it into an option of b. Here we actually need to specify some code. We take as input, well, let's call it input. And the input will be an, an option of A. And now I check what's in it. Because if the kind is empty, then actually the only thing I really can do is I can produce another empty option. I will define constructors. So const option is, I like to define, uh, to keep things uh, a little bit structured. So I have this repository object and I do really like to have uh, the constructors as, um, as uh, clearly stated, clearly organized methods that can be accessed uh, via IntelliSense. This is, of course, uh, generic in the content. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, ah, generic in uh, A, because we don't even care. Or the option, the option is full. But then we need the value. Then we need the content of type A. And this will be kind of full. And the content will be. Well, we don't need to. I'm, I, this is not a course about the specifics of TypeScript or JavaScript, so I'm going to do this uh, mind repetition. I hope the most hardcore among you can forgive it. Now, when input.kind was empty, what do we do? Well, there's nothing we can do, so we take option and we generate a new empty option as a result, because from empty, well, there is no content, so we cannot apply F. It means that we're preserving the structure. And the structure of option is being empty or being full. And so from empty we go to empty, from full we go to full. And let's take a look now in the after the colon, of course, input is full. So input actually has the content of type A. So now we can produce a full option, but we need a content of type B. We cannot just say input.content. This doesn't work because the content has type A. But we have F, and F will transform the content from A to B. And so we went from empty to empty, 
and from full to full and you can actually see that when we go from full to full we take input.content mf and we encapsulate the content so you have three ingredients here you take the thing itself input you transform the content and somehow you encapsulate the structure into the same identical structure all right we could also do this with the uh, we can do this with, uh, with, uh, with types that already exist. So I could say I want a mapping function for arrays. Let's see how far we get. So of course this will, oops, of course the function will take as input an array of A and return an array of B. Well this thing in here doesn't make any sense. So here I take map array and I take the input, which is an array, already has a mapping function. So I'm basically just changing the type, uh, the defining a new interface to call uh, the map array function. All right. Now, when we have one of these structure preserving transformations, there are two properties that always hold, and if they do not hold, the structure preserving transformation is not really structure preserving, and this will lead to dramatic bugs at some point in life. Let's find out how to define structure preserving transformations that are proper, that are proper in the mathematical sense, in such a way that we can guarantee that they compose, and when they compose, if they have these properties, the properties are also present in the result of the composition. This is quite a big deal because it means that we now find out for the first time that there are some rules that objectively define good code. So instead of having to feel what good code means to you or to your grandma or to your best friend Jacob, we actually get objective rules you like it you could even look into the world of mathematical proofs around these rules and properties so that they really belong to mathematics and cannot really be questioned that and these rules tell you what good code is supposed to look like how good code is supposed to behave now what are these properties that guarantee that one of these structure preserving transformations actually behaves like we uh, like we want it The first must be that mapf must preserve the identity function. So if I take mapf and I pass it the identity function, this, kind, this must be the same as the identity. Okay, what does this mean? Well, let's say that I take map container and I pass it id of number. Okay, now this thing is happy. And well, let's say this is uh, F1. Okay, what is this? This thing takes as input a container of number with a given counter. Map container will preserve the counter. So we take as input a container of number, we get as output a container of number where the counter is the same, because this is what map container do. What about the content? The content is a number. What do we do with the content? Well, we take the identity and we apply it to the content. So what we get as a result from F1 is a container of number with the same counter as the input and the same content as the input. So we could say that, well, uh, if we took a function like the identity over a container of number, which, well, you know, very much takes as input a container of number and gives us output a container of number that doesn't even look into it, you know, we can say that f1 is very much equal to f2. or and this doesn't even depend on, on the type of the container. So we can say that, okay, these two things are the same, but actually they are the same for any content we might want. So the container is a well-behaved structure preserving transformation when it comes to preserving the identity. So uh, we want to preserve the identity. So basically, if we pass ID to map, what we get is also an identity function back. What if we did this for array, for example? Map array of, yeah, identity, why not? Well, what map array of identity will do is it will 
take the array we pass as input and keep the structure. And the structure of an array is the number and order of the elements. So if we have five elements in a given order, that is the structure of the array. Where are the elements in the array? Arrays are defined by their positions, by the position of the elements. So if we take map array, what we get is an array with all the original elements just transformed by this function. But if this function does nothing whatsoever, then what we get is the same array. Well, it's a shallow copy of the, of the array, but we don't really care because we're thinking about the types. So also array preserves identity. You will see that option also preserves the identity by virtue of the fact that, well, it, it, it wouldn't preserve the identity uh, if, for example, here, instead of returning a full, um, uh, a full um, option from full to full, we went from full to empty. So this breaks structure, and then if you pass the identity, uh, well, the identity will not, will not be called if the input is full, resulting in a change in the, in, in the surrounding structure. So map option also in this correct implementation preserves the identity. The second constraint is, is more articulated, but it's, it's perhaps almost more interesting. So we want to distribute over a function composition, meaning that if we have two functions, f and g, and we say f then g inside map f, this is actually the same as map f of f, then map f of g. So basically, it doesn't really matter where we put then. Well, it matters from a performance perspective, because this version will create two times the same structure to apply first f to all the content, and then unpack the structure again and apply g to the content. But the result will be the same as creating the same structure, but the content has been transformed by f then g in one go. So let's say that we have map array of incre then double, versus map array of incre, then map array of double. Okay, so in this case, let's say we have an array like uh, 1, 2, 3. Then what happens is we take 1, 2, 3 and every value we increment and double. So 1 becomes 4, 2 becomes 8, does it? No. 2 becomes uh, 3, 6. And 3 becomes 8. Okay. Very good. Now, in this case, well, we start with 1, 2, 3. And, well, the first bit is map array of increments, so this produces 2, 3, 4. But the second bit doubles them and it produces 4, 6, 8. We end up in the same array. Same applies to map option, same applies to map container. It also all very trivially applies to the identity uh, structure, but this, well, I mean, it's not super exciting. Thing that's very important is that you can see that here, when we uh, increment uh, then double in, at, at, as, as, as deeply as possible, we perform as many operations as we can. This will probably be a little faster than creating an intermediate array that we just, then just forget about and discard immediately. And when we have such a structure with a structure preserving transformation, and we know that these rules, these laws actually, so this is uh, law one and this is law two, then what we get is a functor. So f of a map of f respecting the laws, the, uh, respecting our two laws, is called a functor. So the functor is neither the type nor map, nor the laws, it's all these things together. When these things happen together, then the resulting con uh, concept is the functor. Okay, so one might wonder, why do we have identities? Why do we have the identity function? Why do we have the um, why do we have the uh, identity functor? Why do we bother with these things that seem to do nothing whatsoever? Because the ability to state and model the fact that we don't do anything is very important. Let me show you. 
Suppose that we have um, suppose that we have a series of functions, well, like our functions on integers or on numbers, incr, decr, and double. Okay, let's focus on these. And suppose that I have three inputs. Let's say whether or not we want or, or an input from the user. So the user says what they want to do. So const user input. Okay, and the user input can be uh, that they want to do. Uh, and the, sorry, the user input is an array of operations. Like uh, the, 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 the user says what they want to do. So increment, double, or decrement. Okay? But we don't really know what this uh, user input is. So let's say that we have the um, function um, turn user input into active plugin. So the user says which plugins do they want, and we have to turn these plugins on. Okay, so uh, the user choice will be either incr or double or decr. And what I get is an array of user choices, right? And what do I return? Well, I return a function from number to number because this is the result of turning on or off the, the different plugins that the user has requested. Okay. But, hmm, no. So let's say that I, I just create this function that I'm about to return. And for now, I'm going to do something very ugly. I'm going to say, okay, in the beginning, I, I don't know what to put in this function. I just want the compiler to, to stop shouting, okay. But, so what do I do with this function? Well, for every user choice, I have a choice, very good. I know I could do this with a map or a dictionary, but for now I'm, I'm, I don't want to be bothered. If the choice is equal to decra, then uh, I say that f is equal to f, then, and then I, decra, I decrement. And if the choice is uh, incra, of course I uh, add incra, and otherwise if the choice is, well, there's not much choice, the choice is double, then I double. Okay, what's the initial? It's the initial value. Well, I need to be able to return a, a valid function from number to number, even if this array is empty. So even if this array is empty, I need to have something to return. What do I return? The identity. It's, and this looks a lot like if you're building a function that counts, that adds all the numbers in an array, for example, you have to start from zero, from the number zero. In our case, we're counting or piling up uh, all the operations that the user has requested. So if the user says, I just want to incur, okay. Or the user could even say, I want to incur, then incur. I could literally say const uh, the active plugins is turn user input into active plugins and then pass. Nope. I could say user wants to incur. Uh, then incur, then incur again. Okay, cool. Clearly the user wants to increment many times. Okay. What if the user wants to double? Incur, incur, then double. Okay, great. What if the user says, I don't want to turn any plugins on? Well, I mean, we still need a placeholder, and a very good placeholder is the identity, which acts like zero. So, we have seen that we can take a functor, and we've seen already that we can compose the functions we pass into the functor. But next, so, so we can put a fun into a functor. Or we can put fun then fun into a functor. But we can also do, because map f of f is also a fun, so we can do the then of multiple map of f funs. So it all depends out. We can compose funds and functors as far as we want. And this is great because we kind of stumbled immediately, almost randomly, oh, what a surprise, into two apparently unrelated constructs, fun and functor, which we can put together and they seem to work really well and there's no limit to this composition, to their ability to compose. Now, just like then composes functions, can we compose two functors? And the answer is yes. 
Let me start with a, with a concrete example. Let's say that uh, the container, maybe, which is a generic type in, the, in A, is a container where the content might not be there. So it's a container where the content might be empty. Can I map container maybe? Well, let me take the usual type definition. So I take f from a to b, very good. Then I take a function from container maybe of a to container maybe of b. Okay, now, how do we go about this? Actually, this is pretty easy to do because Look, what I could do is take, okay, I could make this complicated. I could say, oh, I take the container of option of A, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I could do this by hand, or I could say, well, let's go, wait a second. So let's define temp one. Uh, and let's say that, uh, well, first of all, I call map option over F. What is temp one? It's a function from option of A of option of B. What if I call map container with temp1 and I call this temp2? Okay, now temp2 is a function that takes as input a container of, well, the input of temp1, which is option of A, and this returns a container of the input of, of the output of temp1, which is an option of B. So this goes from container of option of A to container of option of B, and now I just return temp2, and I'm kind of done. So actually, I could simply say map container of map option of f. You can see that this is basically map option, then map container, but with the parameter f. OK. Can we flip this? Well, of course we can, but then, then obviously the, the, the resulting functor of option with container, so this would be a maybe container, these two things do not have the same meaning because the container maybe always has a counter, but maybe doesn't have a value because there is uh, some validation that needs to happen or whatever. A maybe container, well, the whole thing could be empty. So either we have the content and the counter or we have nothing whatsoever. Now, let's map. A maybe container. Of course, you need to adjust the signature. And well, what do you know? Just need to apply the first map container because the thing that is in contact with the A here is, is a container of A. So first, this map container of F will give me a function from container of A to container of B. Okay, so this takes F and teaches F how to work with containers. But then well, we put map option around it because what we need to deal with is that we have an option and that contains the container. So this map option has to actually check, okay, do, we, do I have a cont container? And if we do have the container, map container says, okay, now let me get the content out, applies F, repackages the container, and option repackages the full option. But if the option was empty, then the whole thing short circuits and goes from an empty option into an empty option just of type uh, container of B. This also works for arrays, of course, and perhaps the example with arrays is even more intriguing because I could say, okay, but what if I have a container of array? This really makes sense because this is a container where the content is a, is a multiplicity of different values of type A. So container of array, uh, container of array, container of array, okay, what's going to happen? Well, the container is the, is, is the outer shell, we open the shell, there's an array now of values, and all these values need to be transformed with map array by applying function f to each value. I can feel a generalization coming. So, given two functors, f and g, with map f and map g respectively. So for example, f is container, g is option, and we have map f, map container, and map g, map option. Then we can say that type fg of a equal to f of g 
of A with function. I'm going to just copy this out of laziness, yes. Uh, map FG, blah, 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 returns uh, a function from FG of A to FG of B, which does, guess what, map F of map G. Then this whole thing is also a functor, meaning that the functor laws, preservation of identity, much more interestingly, the distribution, the distribution over function composition, both hold. It means that functors can be nested into each other, and this nesting can be arbitrarily deep, and what results is a functor. Functors are a special subset of generic types, it's an infinite subset, but it's gigantic. Because there are functors everywhere, by the way, in life. Promise is a functor, map, option, list, array. Uh, even in React, it's very, very difficult to turn a, a React component into a functor. They are just everywhere. Everywhere. And they compose together. Meaning that if you start out with five functors, you can compose them. Like, take the first and the second, and compose them together, it's a functor. And take that and compose it to the third one, it's a functor. And take that and compose it to the fourth one, it's a functor. So you can start with these functors, and then come out with a huge network of synthetic generated functors. And they are all functors. And this is also just even a beautiful image, in a sense. Now, we take a deep breath. And we do something that is actually, and it's the last thing we do today, by the way, in this class. We are going to implement functors in a way that is type safe, thanks to TypeScript advanced types. Now, these examples I will delete, because we don't really care that much about them. Uh, and also, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, yes, this is because we, do, we don't even need the, the curly brackets and, uh, and, the return, uh, and the return statement. Okay. But now we're going to make functors more type safe thanks to TypeScript advanced types. And I hope you're all watching this lecture sitting in a safe and comfortable place because this bit is going to be epic. All right, now um, I'm going to define a, first of all, I'm going to define a placeholder type, which is the unit type, which is a type with only one value. I need this because in some places in the next implement in the rest of this implementation I will need to be able to uh, to have a placeholder type and unit is this type with just one value that we can instantiate out of thin air. Okay, now I will define my repository of all the functors, all the functors in A. And here I will say that ID is ID of A, then array is array of A. Quite important for this to look as epic as possible that the names match. So the name of the type and the name of the key match each other. Uh, then we have the container, uh, the container, which is type container of A. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to say that um, a functor where, so this is a validation function, where f extends a key of functors of unit is equal to f. So basically, this is a way to generate a compiler error whenever f is not one of the keys of functors of, in this case, this placeholder type. So in order for something to be a valid functor, or at least a valid primitive functors, um, then f must be one of the keys of yeah, functors of unit. I don't care about the type. It's a functor uh, if it's id, array, option, or container. You can imagine you can easily extend this by saying, okay, I had a list to be a list of, uh, list of a, etc. So you can just uh, keep, you can add, uh, oh, let's add promise actually. Yeah, why not? Uh, oh, because I don't have map promise. No, no, no. Let's keep it with this because we have the mapping functions for all of them. Okay, so this here is the thing that returns the functor, but also conveniently gives a type error whenever we don't deal um, with a functor, with, with something that is correctly a functor. And also I'm going to define um, a very handy constructor of functor, 
which is, well, I'm going to copy this definition here, which takes as input as generic parameter f, and then the value, the name of the functor f, and this simply returns f. Wait, what did I forget? Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> now we define a type which is then, which is the same as saying one functor followed by another functor. Like this, fg of a would be g then f. So first we apply g, then we apply f. And okay, then. What does then take? It takes two things. The first one, f, and f we really want to be a functor, and then g. G can be whatever we want. Okay, and this type contains uh, the functor to run first and the functor to run second. So before and after. Before is f, after is g. And we define a constructor then, which takes as input, well, exactly the same type parameters. It takes as input f of type f. Uh, f g of type g and this thing returns a then of f g of course and this will be before is f after is g these types here are all just defining structures that are machinery required to represent a primitive factor and how to define a composition of functors. And the composition has to be in the tail. So we want to say, uh, if we have three functors, like array, option, and array again, then we have to say then of array, comma, then of option, uh, comma, array. Okay. Now we can define, um, sort of define uh, some uh, uh, some of these composed factors. So let's say that we want to have an array of array of container of option. I don't want to type it all out and I could say, okay, this is then of. Uh, okay, now this is very nice. Um, I have to do it. Uh, well, I, nah, I, I will do it in, in this order. So then of array followed by then of array followed by then of container and then here I can finally say option. Actually I shouldn't just say option because otherwise the whole thing doesn't know properly what it is so I can wrap it into functor and then this thing knows that what I have is then of array, array, container of option and it knows that all these things are proper uh, are proper uh, functor types or I could uh, define array of array of option. Okay of course no problem and this placeholder functor of option is actually the thing that is required in order for TypeScript to know it's not just a random string, this is actually a valid key of, um, of functors. Okay, then if I have the type of this thing, which is then array array container of option, how do I apply this? So how do I say, okay, what is AACO? of number. Mm. So, enter the type apply. Apply takes as input a functor and whatever we want to apply f on. And then we check if f, I'm going to copy this, extends key of functors of unit. Okay, that's great. Then you know what I can do? I can take functors of a, which are all the functors of a. Okay, these are too many. And then just pick f out of it. Um, wait a second. Oh, functors. Okay, this thing gave me a heart attack. Of course. So if f is either id, array, option, or container, then what do I do? I instantiate 
all the functors. So this is the record with all the functors at, at a type level, and I just pick the right one. So if this is contain, if f is container, this actually takes the key container and gives me container of a. Of course, we need to do more stuff. Like if f extends, then of infer the first and the second. And actually infer g infer h. So if f was built by composing g and h, then what we do is we apply, well, g as last, uh, and we apply h to a. Otherwise, well, we return a type that says cannot apply uh, because f is neither a primitive nor a composite factor. And, well, actually, what does this mean? That either f is a primitive, then we just look it up. If it's not a primitive, it has to come from then uh, of some g and some h. This is what uh, uh, infer does. It extracts from the type of f g and h. And if there are a g and an h to be extracted, the first we take h, so the second, the innermost, and we apply to a. And the result, well, this is just the result here of apply h a is just a type, and so we put g around it. So this is kind of the same as saying g of h of a, but obviously we cannot just say it in TypeScript, so we have to do this slightly longer thing. Okay, so uh, type t, let's say apply uh, type of a a c o to number. Now a a c o we said was a uh, Array, array, container of option. Let's take a look at T. Array, array, container of option. Mine is blown, but not enough yet. Uh, well, let's see if it also works for AAO. Oh, look, array, array of option of number. This thing works. Oh my god. Well, we're not done because we now we now only have the, the thing that composes the types. Let's let's compose the mappings. Okay, now let's define a mapping um, of f where f is implicitly a factor. And we say that well a mapping is a is a function a b from fun a into b, and this returns a fun of apply f to a, the intelligence really is really fighting me together with common sense, which is also fighting us a little bit, but we don't care, we don't care, we're, we're, we're brave people. Um, oops, uh, yes, uh, here we go, okay, so, and why apply? Well, because we would like to be able to say fun of f of a uh, into f of b, but we can't. TypeScript doesn't allow us, but so we have to say apply of f into apply of b. Okay, cool. We have a mapping. Then, now, I want to define all the mappings, just like I have the functors, and I want to say for every key in the functors, well, I want the corresponding mapping. And this, actually, uh, we do procedurally. So we say for every f in key of functors of unit, then I want the mapping of f. So basically for every functor, like for id, I want to have the mapping of id. For array, I want the mapping of array, and so on. Okay, cool. So let's see if this actually says, oh, look, 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 it's saying, okay, for id, mapping id, array mapping array, option mapping of option, container mapping of container. Very clear. Now we define the actual mappings, and this has to have type of mappings, and we actually get a very neat in Type, in, type inference and intelligence, and now I can say, okay, this has to be map ID, uh, array has to be map array. Uh, these objects, like this one, are kind of ugly, and also the functors object, so this I don't really like. Everything else is just peachy, it's like very beautiful. The rest is more universal, I think, than, than the CD repository types. Uh, but again, we are dealing with a language that is being pushed really and thoroughly to the limit. Um, okay. So now, now the thing is happy and also so beautiful that the type inference and the type checker can actually get all these things. Now we get to the point where unfortunately we're squeezing the language a little bit more than it's capable of being squeezed. So now I'm going to define map as the thing that picks the right mapping function, which might also be composed 
uh, from the name of the functor and nothing else. Okay, so I take as input the name of the functor and I have to produce the mapping. All right, so if the type of f is string uh, and f is one of the mappings, then, and this is a bit ugly, and I take the mappings, cast them to any, and just pick f. Because this check is sound, like I just check that. I actually need to do this. No, possible. Yeah, I need to. Okay, so this is basically this. This guard is safe. Like we we are not compile time type safe, but this this construction is type safe. You cannot use it in a non type safe way. It will uh, almost almost. Okay. Anyway, uh, then I'm going to check if after is in uh, yeah f as any uh, and so I'm checking if f has been built with then, like with the then function, so with either this or this, um, and uh, um, in this case I return a synthetic function that is going to look a lot, a hell of a lot, like this one, but specifically uh, well, okay, this this makes uh, this makes no sense. So um, what I'm going to return is well, I map over, I cast f as any, I pick before, which actually happens to be there, like guaranteed, uh, and then I take this, which is a mapping function. So it takes as input the function from unknown to unknown, and now I cast the g as any, and I pick oh ah yes because uh, let, let me check uh, before is f f after is g yeah okay i don't think the names uh, are before and after are exactly ideal uh okay and to this we pass f oh sorry of course f as any of which we pick uh, uh of, from which we picked after. Okay, so this is the uh, end. Uh, bracket missing. And we need to cast this uh, to any. Yes, of course we do. And otherwise, otherwise I'm going to do something like uh, um, forgivable. So I'm just going to return an exclamation mark. Okay, now, now, let's define the mapping one and let's say, okay, this map is of functor of array. Let's take a look at the type of M1. It's a mapping of array, very good. So what if I want to call it? Well, now it takes as input a function from, yeah, whatever. So let's say I give it incra. And what is M1 now? It's a function from array of number to array of number. And, okay, let's take map. And let's pass it. Actually, let's pass it then of functor. Well, this we don't even need. Uh, so container, and then uh, functor of option. Oh, const. Let's take a look at m2. Now, m2 is a mapping of then container of option. All right. Uh, and so, what does it want? Well, it wants a function, but then it will turn a function of container of option into container of option. Okay, okay, so let's say again I give it incra, then what we get is a function from container of option of number into container of option of number. Well, what if I give it incra then uh, greater than zero? Well, now, of course, we get container of option of number into container of option of boolean. And finally, we could use the big one, but in this case, I'm just going to uh, invoke this uh, sort of little variable, which I will move here. And this AACO acts like a proxy for a type definition. And now M3 is the mapping of then array array container of option. And what if we give it incra? And what we get is function of array array container option of number into array array container option of number. <sighs> so what have we seen today? 
what haven't we seen today? We've seen that there is a group of types and functions, of generic types and generic functions over such types, which exhibit a very special behavior that is closed under composition. And the way these things compose with each other is very well defined. The way these, th these things, these functors composed with functions is also very well defined. Uh, the interaction between the function composition and passing func and composing functors with function composition are also very clear and there is mutual respect, we can compose functors together. And obviously, because we've seen that we can uh, compose uh, functors with functions that result from function uh, composition, then we see that functor composition and functor composition uh, and fu <laughs> functor composition and function composition play exceptionally well together. Thank you very much for listening until this point. I hope you're still alive. <laughs>